Welcome, everybody. I'm Susan Bryson. I'm a philosophy professor at Dartmouth College. And this year, I have the great pleasure of being at the University Center for Human Values under the expert direction of Melissa Lane. And I am here to moderate this afternoon's panel on fostering ethical research. I'll introduce the panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. And in the interest of time, since we're running a bit late, um, I'll be brief. Mike Brennan, our first speaker, is a technology program officer on the Internet Freedom Team at the Ford Foundation. Chaitan Baru is a distinguished scientist and associate director of data initiatives at the San Diego Supercomputer Center at UCSD, and is currently on assignment as senior advisor for data science in the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate at the National Science Foundation. Ed Felton, as probably known to most of you, is the Robert E. Kahn Professor of Computer Science here at Princeton, where he's also the director of the Center for Information Policy, Technology Policy. He served during portions of the Obama administration as a technology advisor at the Federal Trade Commission as well as at the White House. So we'll start with Mike Brennan, but please join me in welcoming this afternoon's panelists. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is uh, the first time I'm kind of talking at this intersection. It's actually the first time I'm like talking on a stage about uh, my new job in a, in a space that's like my, more like my old job. I came from academia. I'm now at a foundation. So um, bear with me a bit. I would really love your questions afterwards, and I really love any comments you have afterwards about like what I can expand upon in the future. This is just going to be a few minutes about kind of uh, the intersection that we're talking about here today. Before we get started, can I ask this? How many people here feel like they could tell me what who the Ford Foundation is. Okay, but after, how many people here could feel like they could tell me like what a, what a philanthropic foundation does? Okay, so not everyone, this is good. I just wanna make sure I, I, I kinda of come in out of the right way. So um, <clears throat> I work at the Ford Foundation, which is uh, uh, one of the largest uh, philanthropic foundations uh, in the United States, even in the world. Um, so the way that works and what we do, it, we have this huge endowment, it's over $10 billion, and we spend a certain percentage of that endowment um, every year on, uh, in service of our mission, generally giving to nonprofit organizations, though not exclusively, that are uh, uh, fighting the drivers of inequality uh, around the world. Um, so what that looks like actually is about you know, $500 million a year that we're giving to advocacy organizations, civil rights organizations, human rights organizations, both in the US, about I think somewhere between 55 and 65% of our grant makings in the US, and around the world. We have 10 offices around the world, uh, three in Latin America, four throughout the entire continent of Africa, and then three uh, in Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Um, so, I'm a computer scientist. Um, I did my PhD at Drexel University on privacy and security. I have some colleagues in the room here today. Uh, and you might wonder, like, what's a computer scientist doing at a social justice foundation? Um, and I think what I'm doing here is actually, like, partially why we're all gathered here today, which is to think about the implications that technology and the internet have on the underlying causes of inequality that we seek to reduce you know, around the world. So just a quick bit of background on that. Um, so Ford, I love Ford Foundation's uh, a tagline, which is working with visionaries on the front lines of social change, because it puts Ford Foundation in this kind of service role, right? Like, we're not the ones making the change. We're trying to help the folks who are making that change make it happen. We're, we're hopefully part of the support system. And we divide our work into seven areas of work. And you'll see that one of them, the second one uh, uh, from the end, which is actually the icon swap, uh, I've caught that today, uh, is internet freedom. Um, so internet freedom covers a whole lot of things. This is where I sit as a technology program officer. Uh, we look at uh, issues of, of, um, of policy, things like net neutrality. You know, we're a big supporter of organizations fighting for net neutrality. Uh, we're making a lot of grants this year on that that we didn't think we'd have to make, uh, but now we do. Um, we also look at uh, the people and the institutions that kind of make up the bridge between technical knowledge and the application of technical knowledge in civil rights and human rights and social justice fields. I think a parallel to think about is, um, I imagine most people in this room know the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. You know, this is an organization full of lawyers, lots of legal expertise, applying that legal expertise to civil rights, right? And we're sort of thinking about, okay, what are the parallel institutions applying that technology expertise 
to, to, to uh, civil and human rights. Um, and actually, some examples that we use all the time are folks that came out of here. So I'd imagine a lot of people in this room are familiar with Upturn. Upturn is a great organization based in DC that kind of started, at, had, had its home here, that um, you know applies, tech, they sit at a table with civil rights organizations every month called the, the Civil Rights Leadership Table. And they think about what are the technology issues that are impacting civil rights and how can we get this coalition of groups working on that um, all the time. We think about the people, we think about the kind of role of what we call the public interest technologist. Um, these are people that uh, are applying their technology expertise for the public good, for the public interest in some way. Um, and then we also think about uh, the kind of whole ecosystem of technology, what we call public interest technology, that powers uh, uh, the internet and powers really our lives. And that, that comes with things like looking at, you know, the entire crazy huge system of open source software and code and protocols and standards that govern much of what everyone do, does every day in any way that relates to the internet and technology. Uh, and thinking about how do we make sure that the public interest is represented you know, in, this, in this kind of like public commons of, of, of technology that, that, that we all rely upon. Um, how do we make sure that the power doesn't just sit with um, governments and with corporations to make decisions about these things? How do we make sure that civil society and the public interest is adequately represented? I mean, I can think of no other fields really where we are content to let just the corporations and just governments make these decisions, yet we're kind of in a place like that right now with a lot of the technology that, that um, interact, intersects with our lives. So um, again, bringing this back to this idea of social justice and, and really inequality, um, Ford kind of recently redid its whole strategy to focus on inequality, and they uh, 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 identified five drivers of inequality. These are entrenched cultural narratives, failure to invest and protect vital public goods, unfair rules of the economy, unequal access to government, and persistent prejudice and discrimination. And you know, notice that the internet and technology is not explicitly mentioned in any of those, but I would imagine most people in this room could identify ways in which the internet and technology underpins every single one of those. And that's why the foundation is the first, I believe, uh, at least in the private, private, uh, private philanthropy world, to say, we actually need to make thinking about the internet and technology a core part of our mission and why the internet freedom team that I sit on um, exists. So a, a couple of examples, when you think about Persistent prejudice and discrimination. Is anyone familiar with this article from ProPublica called "Machine Bias"? As some hands raised in the room. So, I mean, ba the, the basics of it is that more and more criminal justice systems around the world are using algorithms or using machine learning to help automate uh, different parts of their of their of the system, right? And and, and the I, I think the motivation behind this stuff is often altruistic in some sense. That's maybe out there that's a bit going a bit far, but it's not malicious. Certainly, people are saying like, oh, judges have to make decisions about like how likely it is for someone that's convicted is going to commit a crime again, and that's going to factor into how long their sentence might be. Uh, well, uh, maybe we can have a machine, a computer, make this decision, and it won't be uh, biased like how people make these decisions. Except what's been found is that when you implement these systems. Um, even if it gets the overall average right, it might say like, oh, it, it correctly predicts, you know, uh, in, in general, the number of, of years that people should be sentencing. The, it's very disproportionate about how that plays out in different communities. So for example, in this study, um, the prediction fails like very differently for black defendants than it does for white defendants. So people that are labeled higher risk but didn't reoffend, um, I, I should, I'm going to say this another way. Um, you're twice as likely to be incorrectly labeled as a higher risk uh, uh, convict if you're a black person than if you're a white person. And twice as likely to be given a lower and shorter sentence incorrectly like labeled as low risk um, if you're a white person than a black person. So this is a good example of you implement a system like this and instead of making a decision more like neutral and unbiased, it's actually cementing bias. And you know why does this happen? Well, I would argue that part of it is because the people designing these systems are not necessarily trained or talking about or thinking through the different ways in which these systems, these technologies they're building are uh, going to be affecting in uh, uh, society. Um, another example in like another realm of uh, we go back so that was under persistent prejudice and discrimination. Another one going to um, failure to invest in and protect uh, public uh, vital public mm -hmm. goods. Um, we recently commissioned a report, you can look it up if you just type like Digital Infrastructure Ford Foundation, um, all about uh, open source software 
and how it powers much of our world. And you have technologies that are being developed by volunteers, uh, largely, with limited budgets, largely, that are inc of increasing importance for society. I think uh, one example of this would be OpenSSL and, and Heartbleed. How many people here are familiar with Heartbleed when I say that? Name? Okay, pretty much everyone. So that's, that's great. So I want, I'm not going to go into it um, in more detail, but that's a good example of like a piece of what I would argue is infrastructure, right? Like infrastructure for our daily lives that is at risk because it's part of a public commons that's not being adequately protected. Um, and then the final thing, I just want to come back to the, to the earlier point I made about people. Um, we think a lot about how individuals, the role that individuals play uh, in this space and how can we create a meaningful, sustainable career paths and uh, for people with technology expertise that want to apply that, that expertise in the public interest. I'm just gonna highlight one of our programs that we support, the Ford Mozilla Open Web Fellows. This is place, and this is a photo of the eight technologists that are currently in place in our year two, and I believe the year three applications are opening up in the next few weeks if they're not open already. Um, these are people placed in organizations ranging from Freedom of the Press Foundation to Color, uh, Color of Change to Citizen Lab to Privacy International. Um, these are organizations that, excuse me, through this program, get a technologist for 10 months to work with them and help them think through bigger picture, bigger picture questions as it relates to technology and their work. And the goal of programs like this, we support a number of programs like this, is to both help organizations understand the role that technologists can play in their organizations um, from a social justice perspective, and also help people with technology backgrounds and a desire to use that for the public good um, find opportunities to grow their skills, grow their capacities at that intersection. Um, I'm probably going on a little, for a little too long now, so um, I'll stop there. There's a lot more to talk about. Happy to answer any questions during the panel. Uh, and I guess I'll turn it over to Chai Tom now. Good afternoon. Um, unfortunately, I think your lunch is just about settling down now, so uh, this is going to be a challenge. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so thanks very much to Arvin for in inviting me to this meeting. And uh, as was mentioned, I'm currently a senior advisor for data science and the computer science directorate at the NSF. I've been there now almost three years and intend to be there for another uh, year, which will be my last year at NSF. Um, so uh, some of the, 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 broadly the things that I do uh, at NSF are uh, three categories. One, I'm actually involved in a program. <clears throat> There's a team of program directors uh, who run this, but this is the big data research program that NSF has. Um, and I have um, responsibility for that, along with our uh, full team. Um, <clears throat> And uh, the other thing that I do is uh, a lot of my time is actually spent on strategic uh, activities and thinking for our, about our next uh, set of things to do, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So one of the strategic, strategic directions that NSF has uh, selected is called uh, Harnessing the Data Revolution, and I'll talk about that. And I think there are a lot of connections there uh, to some of the issues we've been talking about here in ethics and so on. And the third thing I do is uh, I'm, I co-chair one of these interagency uh, working groups, and I also participate in others. Uh, so I co-chair the one that's uh, called the Big Data Interagency Working Group, and that's where Ben was our speaker, uh, a very well-received <laughs> talk that he gave. In fact, I think he got, uh, I don't know if you know, but he got reinvited to this other group, uh, which I'm a member of. It's called the Federal Data Cabinet, which was all started under DJ Fardel's time uh, when Ed was there. At the White House, um, the Federal Data Cabinet is really a gra grassroots uh, group of all the chief data officers across the federal government. So I got a membership of, of about 120 people or so. It's a very energetic group because it's grassroots and they care about all these aspects of data science. So anyway, so that's the background. Um, <clears throat> I also met Ben at the Dark Stool uh, workshop as uh, uh, Christine. So some of us were at that meeting. Um, and, and the reason I was at that meeting, of course, was this is an area we're very interested in. My own background is as a computer scientist. I'm a hardcore database systems guy, parallel computing, high performance databases, and so on. Uh, as mentioned, I've been at the Supercomputer Center for the last 20 years, but 
at NSF, um, we are looking at the data science portfolio and we, we are looking at the entire stack, as I'm going to uh, <clears throat> mention uh, right now. Everything from sort of the infrastructure all the way up to sort of organizational issues and, and research uh, up and down that. Okay. So uh, the harnessing uh, the data revolution, one of the NSF big ideas, is in the context of the set of NSF big ideas that were recently put out last year. Uh, some of you may already have heard about this, that, but basically there are six big research themes, research ideas, and there are four sort of process ideas. And the process ideas are about how, would it, how should it, things change at NSF to get some of these things done in future. And the uh, research ideas, as you can see, the first one is called Harnessing Data for the 21st Century Science and Engineering. That's what we refer to as HDR, or Harnessing the Data Revolution. Uh, the others are you know, work at the human technology uh, frontier, so with, with all the changes uh, that are happening in things like robotics, AI, lots of data around, how does that affect uh, work, uh, the workplace, and the interaction uh, that people have uh, with all those technologies. Uh, another one is about basically next generation uh, understanding the universe, next generation astronomy and uh, gravity, gravitational waves and so on. So that's windows on the universe. Uh, there's one on quantum um, technologies, so the quantum leap. One on navigating the new Arctic. Um, and then one on understanding the rules of life, so it's basically genomes to phenomes. Um, <clears throat> the one, one of the process ideas that's uh, of a lot of relevance here uh, is called convergence that's down there. So convergence is this idea that so NSF r recognizes that in order to do all of these problems, in order to address the complex issues that are there in this next generation of uh, research that we want to do, uh, what we really need is very strong multidisciplinary approaches. So that's the notion of convergence, so multidisciplinarity. And, and the, by the way, there's a working group for each of these. I co-chair the uh, Harnessing Data Working Group, but there is a working group for convergence and the way they talk about it is convergence is not just about people working together, but it's about people thinking together. So it's sort of the next uh, level up, right? And clearly, you can imagine that things like ethics, etc., and policy issues combining with computer science are very much uh, uh, something that we care about. <clears throat> so now I'll say a little bit about the harnessing the data revolution idea. It's, it's basically uh, it's basically NSF's uh, sort of activities related to data science, right? So fundamental uh, research in data science and engineering aspects. Uh, also looking at what kind of data infrastructure uh, should, we, should we have uh, across the nation uh, in, in research infrastructure to support research in data science and engineering. And of course, uh, the education and, and training part, okay? <laughs> So um, we've come up with sort of five themes uh, in this, in this uh, uh, big idea area. Um, as shown here, so the science domain, so of course everything at, uh, is motivated by the needs of the science and engineering uh, directorates and, and, and how research in all of those areas is being transformed by uh, data intensive uh, science and engineering. So we're able to collect a lot more data, we have to process things more, in many cases we have to do this in real time. So all of those are challenges that all of our science colleagues are facing, and that's the backdrop um, uh, on which we want to then do other research to support uh, the ability to do data intensive uh, science and engineering. Um, sitting on top of that is, you know, what are the kinds of systems and algorithms? So that's more the computer science aspect of data science and engineering. So what do we need to develop uh, in order to support and enable that kind of research, which is data intensive in nature? Um, and then there are the foundations. Um, so what are the foundations of data science uh, that might make it different from just computer science alone or statistics alone, et cetera? Um, and so that's the area of, uh, and that, I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, we have, uh, there is a notion of convergence there as well. We have different uh, groups within NSF coming together uh, to look at the foundational aspects. And then the cyber infrastructure and education and workforce. So like I say, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, in, a, in a sense, the challenges of data intensive science and engineering come from all of our domains uh, that, that are at NSF, which is basically all of science except uh, medicine. Uh, one of the things that we are thinking about here is this notion of translation. And I think that's one place where the ethics idea clearly comes in. So the, 
So we are stealing sort of the idea from uh, translational science, which is really uh, translational medical science that those folks have used, which is this notion of, uh, you know, when you take methods from the lab to the bedside, from the clinic to the bedside, there's a lot of stuff that happens along the way, and actually there's a lot of learning also that happens along the way, a lot of adaptation of techniques. And we believe there's something similar in data science. I mean, if we talk about foundational aspects of uh, data science, whether they're coming from machine learning, statistics, data management, etc., applying those to these real applications in all of these sciences and engineering, uh, or in society in general, uh, there is a process uh, in doing that. And that whole process is something that we think needs to be treated as sort of a first order activity. Um, so that's this notion of uh, translational data science, and I think ethics uh, definitely comes into that picture. So it's this idea of, you know, when you're doing something in your lab, there is one level of concern that you might have, but what if you're going to now deploy it uh, out there in the wild and people are going to start using it, there's another level of concern. So we have to think about those kind of things. Um, and under systems and algorithms as well, uh, here are the typical things like, you know, predictive analytics, data mi mining, machine learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the things that we are interested in going forward is this notion of sort of uh, what we are informally calling fair data science, right? Fair, interpretable, transparent, trustworthy, auditable uh, data science techniques. Uh, once again, if you're going to use this either in scientific uh, uh, research in order to do deductions and inferences, you have to have systems that can explain to you how they came up with this conclusion so that you know, so the scientists will understand why this uh, result came about. Same thing applies to society. If you're going to use these in very serious sort of decision support things, which already these systems are being used in, uh, we would like to have some notion of interpretability. There has to be a notion of auditability, trustworthiness, and so on. So this is an area we we'll probably want to em emphasize a little bit more is uh, what are the f computer science things we can do, everything from data management all the way through machine learning, and, and perhaps even things like visualization and so on, where we can push on these uh, kind of themes. Uh, I won't go into the details, uh, this slide just gets into more of that, but basically the point being, you know, we have all sorts of uh, predictive analytics uh, techniques that uh, work today. Uh, they may be accurate, they do a great job, but they may not be very explainable. They may not be able to tell them, a lot of them may be black box models that can't tell you uh, why they did, came to the conclusion that they did. And we would like to come to a place where we have more open, transparent models. Um, then foundations, <laughs> as I said, there is a convergence there. So we, we think the foundations of data science really involve computer science, statistics, and math. So you know, we call this the local convergence between those three disciplines coming together, uh, really trying to establish uh, this is not just about analytics. It's about the entire life cycle of data. So everything from data collection to data cleaning, uh, metadata, provenance, uh, reproducibility, and also the analytics. So the whole life cycle. So what, what are the foundational aspects uh, of that? And uh, there was just recently a, um, a solicitation out called Tripods. So Tripods is Transdisciplinary Research in Principles of Data Science, uh, which is jointly by Computer Science and DMS, which is our Division of Math Sciences. Uh, that's the math and stats folks. Uh, we had a tremendous response uh, to this. Uh, the, pro the, pl the plan of this program is in the first phase, which is going on right now, so the reviews are about to happen and decisions will be done in a, in a month or so, uh, is to have t about 10 or so mini centers. Uh, each center is required to have uh, at least these three people with background in computer science, math, and stats coming together uh, to create the center um, and push on some of the researchy aspects related to the foundations. Uh, with the idea that uh, there will be a phase two in which um, these sort of mini centers or centerlets uh, will then gel together and we will fund larger centers across the country on the order of maybe three or so. Um, and so that's, so that's that program. Um, so here's a question I mean, <laughs> to this group. Uh, you know, as I said, the convergence that has happened in defining this particular solicitation was between CS uh, math and stats, so the question is, can things like ethics be somehow be thought of as foundational? I, I don't know, but uh, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff we are 
thinking about doing and uh, in the process of maybe trying to start a few initial activities related to cyber infrastructure, which I won't say anything about since that's not sort of directly relevant here. Uh, but education and workforce is a big, uh, really important issue for us. So the education is thinking more about um, sort of the future, 5, 10, 15 years from now, what should data science look like and what are the issues there. Um, the workforce issues being how do we take all the scientists, engineers, etc., who are coming out right now and train them in some of these data science techniques so that they can use it uh, in their work. Um, <clears throat> I think I have a slide coming up. Oh, um, one uh, thing that's related to um, that activity is a dear colleague letter that's out right now, currently active. I think the due date is May 15th, and uh, in fact, I had to take a phone call this morning from somebody who was interested in this. So we get, again, seeing a lot of interest in, in a response to this, uh, what we call DCL, dear colleague letter. Uh, so it's a dear colleague letter that really talks about this notion of convergence. So the, the colleague, dear colleague letter says we want to grow this area of convergence at NSF and there are four sections in it for each of the, for four of the big ideas. The section in Harnessing Data Revolution talks about our interest in, do, interest in doing workshops um, that sort of look at this issue of convergence from the point of view of how do you develop curriculum. So how do you develop curriculum in data science that brings together the technical aspects, but also uh, considers the domain-related aspects. So one idea, if you read the uh, DCL, basically we are saying, can we distinguish um, what are things that people might need to learn in data science that are common to everybody doing data science, and then how, do, how might some of those things may be adapted to different disciplines? So if you take, just as an example, say data quality uh, and error. Right? So there may be some general notions of quality and error that everybody should be aware of. But then if you're a high energy physicist, your error and quality comes from one aspect uh, of the data, which may be the sensors uh, in the uh, colliders and so on, versus if you're an ecologist or a social scientist, it comes from a totally different source. So then there's some adaptation of that notion to the different disciplines. So we, we want to pursue some of these kind of ideas, and uh, as I said, there's a lot of interest uh, in that. Um, all right, now I'm not sure if I have that slide, so let me just mention it here, and if it's there, that's fine, we can skip it. Um, the other thing we have done in the education area is uh, funded the National Academy of Sciences to do a couple of workshops uh, on this, uh, which are about uh, envisioning the data science discipline uh, at the undergraduate level. And we explicitly called it envisioning because we, we wanted the group to think about five, 10, 15 years from now, not today. So today, almost every school, uh, almost every university is thinking about spinning out some kind of data science program. So today's problems are already being tackled, whether they're at the master's level or undergrad level and so on. What we said is, well, what if you took a step back? Don't worry about your college structures that you have, who's the dean for what, and what's the prov provost care about, and what are your funds on campus? But if you just imagine that there is this discipline called data science, what should it look like? Secondly, and, and since it's at an undergraduate level, we really care about what should K through 12 do to feed into this undergraduate program, and also community colleges. So some of the things I'll mention there, um, <coughs> in, in the recent National Science Board meeting that happened maybe a month or so ago at NSF, there was actually a session about sort of policy and future issues, and a very interesting study that uh, one of the NSB members had done on what's the blue collar worker of the knowledge economy going to be like. Right? So, so, if we, so one thing we believe in is that the data is a very big agenda. It's not a small thing, it's going to permeate everything. And there are going to be jobs up and down the stack. It's not just your PhD in machine learning who's getting a $500,000 job at Google. <laughs> uh, there, are going to, there are going to be jobs like data curation of all sorts where you might not need a four-year undergrad degree from an R1 university to do this. So we want to explore all of those notions. I mean, how, where are these other jobs, you know, these other tasks going to be done and what kind of training do you need? So we just finished last two days, the first workshop uh, on this. Uh, there were lots of interesting discussions. There was this idea of, you know, is there, 
what would a BS in data science look like versus a BA in data science. So the BS might be the one that's the more technical uh, thing, the BA might be the one that's a liberal arts education that gives you a broad awareness of data but may not have the same kind of prerequisites and so on and so forth. Um, okay. <clears throat> so now quickly I just want to say that they have, uh, this is a new area obviously for us, there's a lot of excitement even, uh, I have to say, I had lots of interesting things uh, so far today uh, and clearly you all know this, excitement in these kind of things on centers like this and other areas on campuses. Um, so I just wanted to mention some of the things that we have done but this, this is just the beginning. I think definitely NSF is, uh, I'm sure, looking for ideas from the community as to what we should be doing. But here are some early things that we funded uh, actually way back in 13. So 2013 we funded this Ethics of Algorithms uh, project um, which I think, I think recently had a, uh, had a workshop about that. Uh, back in 2014, we funded the Council for Big Data Ethics and Society, which is where I met Arvind first, I think, in New York City. Uh, Dana Boyd, uh, Jeff Bowker, Kate Crawford, Helen Nissenbaum, they are all the principals uh, in that activity. Um, <clears throat> and those, by the way, those two were funded by the IIS Division, uh, Informatics and uh, Information Systems Division of Computer Science. But then there's a whole bunch that the social science have started funding as well. So these are more recent from 2016, uh, Workshop on Advancing Ethics for Trustworthy Cyberspace and Data Analytics, uh, Development of Ethical Cultures in Computer Security Research, uh, Qualitative Research Ethics in the Big Data Era, um, and then some, this is a little bit more technical uh, topic of ethics of data aggregation, so what happens if you put data from multiple sources together and what are the sort of dangers of doing that. Um, so this was the slide I wasn't sure that I had. <laughs> so this is what I just told you about, right? So this is the workshop that we did. And this is my last slide. And I think one of the things that's come up there, and actually I, I think the first time I heard this idea was from Erwin. And I, I was chasing this down and I found it, I think it was a CACM article you had uh, uh, that I found. But I think it's this notion that uh, ethics has to be embedded everywhere. And this also came up quite a bit in our workshop the uh, last couple of days. It's not just, uh, um, you know, have a lecture in a course or uh, have a separate course that teaches you this. I think this has to, the curricular materials themselves should deeply embed these ideas so that, as someone said this morning, when you graduate from a program, you already know this. And so when you go to a job, you are already raising these kind of issues because that's how you got trained. So that's, that's all I have. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to do two things. First, to reflect on what we've heard earlier in the day through the lens of my own experience in computer science research. And second, um, I want to talk a little bit about what the role of computer science researchers might be in advancing the broader uh, ethics and policy discussions beyond our own discipline. So first, lessons from uh, from today uh, about computer science research ethics. Um, most of my research that has uh, raised challenging ethical issues has been in the area of uh, security and privacy, um, and in particular um, uh, relating to the treatment of information about vulnerabilities in security systems or privacy risks. Um, this is an area um, and what, what, is, what has particularly struck me in, in the morning's discussion here were several points. First, the idea that ethics needs to be about more than just compliance. That yes, you need to make sure your lawyer is happy if that applies. And you need to make sure that your IRB is happy if that applies. But the roles of your lawyer and the IRB, um, although important, are far from covering the full range of ethical issues that you need to deal with. Um, in fact, um, uh, and, um, and therefore, uh, especially in what is often in a field where the ethical thinking is still emerging and there are not strong, well-established, written down norms, there's a responsibility to, uh, to think about what you're doing and why. 
Um, and in my own experience, I had um, a, a, a discussion with an ethicist very early in my research career in security, uh, which I keep coming back to because it really helped me understand what it is that we are trying to do and what our ethical responsibilities are and to whom in doing research where we are talking about vulnerabilities and risks. Um, and so um, going beyond compliance is key. Pre-research review is very important. Obviously, if you want to know if the airplane is going to be safe, it's best to inspect it before the flight uh, rather than uh, explaining afterwards uh, in filling out paperwork why it, why it was okay. Um, and yet often researchers uh, tend to fall into the trap of thinking about ethics as uh, a task of explaining after the fact why what you did must have been okay. Um, so so uh, pre-research review is very important if, um, and uh, it will save you from, from trouble. Um, in some settings, um, it, it has been known to occur that people do research and then have ethical second thoughts and respond about what they have done and respond by not publishing or respond by uh, not publishing everything they know about what they did and what they found. Um, and that's obviously um, not an acceptable way to proceed. Uh, one of the challenges in uh, applying ethics in research, I think, is the problem of how to connect abstract ethical principles and discussions to the, the hands-on practice of what you're doing in the lab. Um, often, uh, if you learn some ethical theory, if you do maybe some cases, you're able to spot issues. You're able to know when there is an ethical issue to be addressed. Um, but connecting that to what you should do, now that I know I have an ethical issue, now that I know what my responsibility is, how do I actually put that into practice? How, should I, how can I change what I do? How, how should I be handling this data? Researchers often uh, would like to see a set of methods or even a cookbook they can follow once they have spotted an issue and understand what they're trying to do. Uh, and I think we have some um, uh, there's some unmet need to fill in that gap and give people more of a cookbook. Uh, but I want to focus especially on ethics communication. Um, that is um, how we talk about uh, the ethical choices and actions that, that we've taken. Um, and this is, I think, incredibly important. Uh, and for several reasons. First of all, where there are not yet hard and fast written rules and guidelines that we can follow, it's very important to, uh, as part of our ethical responsibility, to explain clearly why we did, why we did what we did and what our, our ethical thinking about it was. Um, that is, when compliance is not going to be enough, then transparency about your ethical thinking is really one of the most important mechanisms for accountability. Uh, also, as Nick described earlier, doing this helps the field develop its norms and practices so that other researchers will have the benefit of hearing what you have to say about how you think of the ethics of what you were doing. Whether they agree or disagree, you at least are advancing the conversation. Uh, but even beyond um, the value of, that you get in writing the ethics, ethical considerations part of your paper, um, I feel pretty strongly that having a clear ethical understanding of why you're doing what you're doing and why you're maybe not doing something else helps you to communicate the overall value of your work in an appropriate way. When you write that section at the beginning of your paper that explains the motivation, why did we do this? What value does this provide for the research community? What broader impact is it going to have on society? Um, that will inevitably be connected to the ethical decisions that you've made. Um, and you will do a better job of explaining your impact and you will have a better focused impact if you have thought about the ethics and if that remains in your mind when you're talking about how to motivate your work. And then finally, if you are working in an area where there, where there might be contention around your work, where it might make somebody powerful angry, um, then it's extremely important to have communicated clearly about why you did what you did. Um, if someone disagrees with your work, and especially if they have their own full-time PR staff, your motives will be challenged, and you'll be very happy that you communicated clearly about why you did what you did and why it was justified. Um, and the more you're consistent about, 
about communicating from a position that is ethically well supportable, the happier you'll, you'll be. Let me turn now to think a little bit of, of uh, thinking about the role of computer science research in uh, ethical areas that may go outside of computer science itself. Um, and one example here, um, which was mentioned earlier, uh, Mike showed the, um, uh, the, uh, an image from the ProPublica article that was um, criticizing the use, uh, use of certain algorithms in criminal sentencing. Um, that uh, this idea of increasing the accountability of the applications of computer science, uh, for example, in criminal justice, uh, I think there's a lot that computer science researchers can do to advance that conversation. And it's not just about detecting and pointing out bad uses. Uh, there was some um, uh, really worthwhile computer science work that went into the support of that ProPublica article that, that Mike referenced. And that was an important part of it. Um, but opportunities will also exist um, to use technology as an anti-bias mechanism. And, and, and in a few ways. Uh, first, uh, we can use computer science, we can use machine learning, for example, to help better understand human decision making. Um, if we do not use technology in, say, criminal sentencing decisions, those decisions will emerge from the minds of judges. Um, and uh, even the best trained and, and, and best intentioned judge um, will have a difficult time avoiding bias and will have a difficult time uh, thinking in the way that we would think best about how to make these decisions. Um, and by looking at data about how judges behave and how other dis human decision makers behave, we can better understand what they do and we can have a better picture of how bias emerges in human decision making. Because after all, for all of the criticism that happens of uh, deep learning models as super complicated and not really, um, and difficult to, to understand, and not really very good at explaining why they did what they did, you could say the same thing about the human brain. It's super complicated, we don't understand it very well, and it's fundamentally not very good at explaining to us why it did what it did. Uh, and in the same way that we can use technology to understand why a deep network did what it, what it did, we can similarly try to use um, machine learning to understand human decision making better. Uh, we can also use technology to try to improve the transparency and accountability of decision processes in a lot of ways. Um, and we have past papers about that. Um, and we can take seriously, I, I think sometimes take more seriously, some of the studies whose results uh, make us very queasy. Uh, and someone referred this morning to this um, now famous or infamous study that showed that um, it was, uh, in which researchers um, said that they could predict whether a person was likely to be convicted of a crime uh, based only on an image of that person's face. So you can say that's an instance of bias, and indeed, uh, it's obviously unacceptable for that to be the case. But um, I want to go back to this idea of understanding human decision making, because we need, at least need to be open to the hypothesis that the algorithm is doing what it should do, and accurately predicting whether this person is likely to be convicted of a crime, and that the problem is that the humans who make decisions about conviction um, are biased. Um, and I think, the, uh, I think often we are willing to blame an algorithm for something uh, for being biased in a case where even if that is the case, there is also a lesson about human bias and human decision making. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about how we can uh, how computer science researchers have a key role to play in improving the ethical discourse around data and privacy. Now, this is a pervasive issue uh, ac across a lot of commercial applications and a across a lot of research applications in many disciplines. The problem being that uh, researchers or commercial entities may collect large data sets um, and they may be in compliance with a set of often outdated rules uh, which are designed to protect privacy. For example, we collect no personally identifiable information um, is the common story one often hears. And there is now a, a pile of computer research, uh, computer science research um, halfway to the sky, some of the most important research in that area done by Arvind. 
um, that shows that that idea of personally identifiable information and the idea that if we avoid collecting PII, we're safe, there's not a privacy risk, is, um, was never a good idea and now certainly is not sustainable. And yet, we don't have, um, we have a, only the very beginning of a theory about how to do better um, and, uh, and about uh, how to think about these risks and, uh, and how to understand what responsibilities we might have um, in, collecting, in collecting data. And I think computer scientists and computer science research can do a lot to help advance that discussion, to provide a better toolkit for putting um, ethical considerations into effect in other research disciplines and in, in commerce. So with that, um, I am, uh, I'll stop and um, I look forward to the discussion with my other panelists and all of you. Thanks. Thank you for these illuminating presentations. I'll ask the panelists to, oh, okay. While people are getting seated, um, I want to let people know that we can go until 2 o'clock, so we do have time for, for questions, uh, and I will keep a speaker's list. I'm going to use my chair's prerogative to, to ask the first question. I was very intrigued by what Chaitan said about ethics uh, and data science being needing to be merged, needing to be inseparable. And I'm wondering, for all the panelists, what would viewing ethics as foundational to data science look like? Um, how, how is it possible to embed ethics everywhere? Uh, and as someone who does ethics, I, I wanted to acknowledge one concern that I sometimes have about the field that's known as applied ethics, that sometimes people just say, okay, we're going to take an ethical theory. Right, utilitarianism or a, a deontological theory and apply it to this issue over there as if ethicists have got all this stuff worked out and it's just a matter of taking the ethical theory and viewing uh, an issue in light of that. And I would just like to caution against that and I hope that the field of ethics, the people who are practicing ethics in this domain um, with data scientists are learning about the new ethical issues that are arising from the research that you're doing and that ethics is, the field of ethics is being changed as a result. But my question for you is then how, how to integrate ethics into this? How, how to embed ethics? I'd like to be an embedded ethicist in a <laughs> data science program, but how would that work? I guess I'll take the first cut, um, <laughs> perhaps. The, um, so often in data science applications, what you're fundamentally trying to do is to, um, you're trying to optimize something, you're trying to predict something. Um, uh, and these problems will quickly be abstracted into some kind of a mathematical challenge to, to maximize something. Um, and uh, practitioners go immediately to a measure of accuracy or, or um, of what they're doing um, and then try to optimize that. Um, and then there's some other technical things you do to, to make it work better. Um, but um, I think you, one way to incorporate ethics is to just pervasively think a little bit more deeply about what the goal is that you're trying to achieve and what are the values that you're trying to protect in designing this system. It's not just about being able to accurately predict something, it's also about making sure that other values are, are, um, are recognized. And, um, you can, um, and you can incorporate that directly into, the, um, uh, into what you're doing. And you can talk um, pretty explicitly about the ways in which you end up trading off different values or trying to reach some kind of balance where they are in, uh, in, in opposition. Um, and I think if that, if the discourse of the field sounds like that, you've gone a long way. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm no means the expert at this, but no, a couple of things, uh, examples that I was thinking about um, in this context, as I said, I'm a database guy. Um, so you know, <clears throat> there are these introductory introductory courses in database uh, uh, systems that you know kids take, and uh, first thing you learn about is data modeling, and then you learn to create a database. 
you do it, you create a database, you do some homework problem or a class assignment. To me, that would be the, a great place to introduce something like, okay, let's see what data does Facebook collect and what does this schema look like? And, and then say, why are they collecting this data? Are they, should, should they collect this data? So, uh, so when I think of ethics, it's at that level, not the theories and, and so on that you're saying, but <clears throat> why not teach those things right at the point when you're teaching the kids how to model data, right? So you bring up those things in the context. Similarly, you can do for software engineering. I mean, you can talk about uh, how much testing should you do and uh, not just the technical aspect of it, but the ethical aspect of it. When I, I worked for IBM, for a few years and you're always trading off uh, the deadline date with uh, functionality and testing and so on. There's always these real world yeah. trade-offs that you have to make and you actually never learn <laughs> those kind of things in school. Yeah. And that's why I felt some of the best education I had was that actually at IBM because I learned those things. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I actually think, uh, in, so wherever you introduce uh, ethics uh, or is throughout in any course in CS, it actually might be interesting to even mention some of even the theories that you're talking about. I mean, it would be like going to somebody in, in another discipline and saying, you know that there are different data formats. There are structured data and there is text data and there is, you know, semi-structured data. And it's good for you to know this because, you know, Excel spreadsheets fall, fall in this category and something else falls in that category, which is almost like a literacy level knowledge. Yeah. So. Um, so uh, Something I say a lot when I talk about kind of ethics in this is I, I, so as a computer scientist, my entire career, my entire career in academia as an undergraduate, master's degree, PhD, the only time that I was forced to talk about, to think about ethics was when I took like my one credit ethics class as an undergrad where they were basically like, don't be a hacker. Don't be like a bad hacker. <laughs> and bad so, so great, okay, fine, I can do that. Um, <laughs> And, and then even like, you know, I got introduced to what the IRB was after I, like, I think during my first uh, research study as a PhD student because my, my advisor fortunately knew that they were important and like brought us on board. Um, and I think what it comes to, I think, you know, when I think about this, I think, you know, people, people care about ethics. They care about doing things the right way. They care about creating things that aren't going to harm people. But they don't always have the framework. I certainly didn't have a framework in which how to think about these things and incorporate it into my daily life as a technologist. So what I'm thinking about now, I agree with everything that's been said. What I'm also thinking about now at the foundation is like, what are the, what's the, what are the roles that, that, what are the things that can be done in the space to encourage and incentivize that kind of thinking? Um, and I'm thinking of a parallel real quick when, when I think about, um, specifically, specifically at our foundation and how we think about uh, underrepresented communities, underrepresented people in the work that we support. You know, like now at the Ford Foundation, if you get to the point where you're submitting a proposal, you have to define what underrepresented means in the context of your work, and then explain what your what what your kind of mission and idea is around that. Now, I like that it's about defining it in context because it's not about applying necessarily the same measurements to everyone. But it and and it's not also not like a oh you you don't get a grade of like pass or fail on that thing, but it's it inserts that thinking into the conversation. And I've been able to then, because of that, have a conversation with grantees of mine to say like, wow, you're, you're, you're a global serving uh, uh, project, but your entire board of advisors is made up of mostly men from North America and Europe. Like, what's that about? Why, you know, is that, is that effective for what you're trying to do? And I think there are similar things that could be done, and I think are being done around ethics. Like, you know, I remember an encouraging conversation at the Privacy and Hints and Technologies Conference a few years ago after there was a few uh, potentially problematic uh, research talks around uh, the Tor project and some research that was done uh, on, on Tor data. They said, well, maybe we should, I don't know that they actually implemented this in this way, but then maybe we should actually require an ethics statement. And we talked, this came up a few times today. Force people to think about it, force people to address it. Um, to think about, um, um, you know, the, the roles that professors and academic curriculums can take in computer science to, to, to to, as Chetan was saying, like bring these things to bear in the as you're teaching people how to be um, computer scientists. I don't know that the specifics of how this is, can be done effectively. I think there's a lot of thinking to be done around it, but I do believe that people care. They want to incorporate it. You just need to give them a helpful framework to incorporate it and allow it to kind of get, give them the space in which that that can emerge, um, rather than like forcing a top-down, uh, forcing like super specific rules like on top 
too quickly, uh, though I think we certainly probably need to get there too in terms of having like really strong norms to to address. Thank you. That's very helpful. Chris, can I, can oh, I just ahead. add sure. one more? I was just thinking the. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, by the way, I had zero credits in ethics in my, <laughs> in my entire life. I improved um, one. <laughs> um, uh, so since she's not in the room, I won't use the name, but, you know, I was talking to a famous philosopher um, about the, exactly this point, and she was a little annoyed that... Um, so, so I don't know if the question you asked if, if I should interpret it a little negatively or not. I don't know which way you asked it, <laughs> because, you know, you're talking about applied ethics and so on. But uh, I've heard, have had the reaction where people say, well, you know, that's not easy to do, and you've got to train people to learn how to teach ethics and so on and so forth. Um, and that was the reaction from this philosopher. Um, it might be a computer science mentality, but I sort of view that as that's an opportunity. There's an opportunity for the field to grow. So rather than complaining that, no, you guys uh, don't really know how to do this thing, you know, pedagogically and so on, well, let's take that on as how do we... I mean, it may take many years for us to get the capability in place, but how do we train such people and develop such curriculum? No, I think that's very important, and I think many professional philosophers haven't yet absorbed the lesson that, that Mike was just presenting with us, that, that it really matters to hear the voices of people in underrepresented groups. Philosophy traditionally has been done as if from a God's eye point of view, discussing eternal verities. And when you're talking about social justice issues, it's important to actually listen to the voices of the people who are affected. Um, so I, I think I might get what the philosopher was saying. It, it, it does sometimes chafe when you're talking with people in other fields and everybody's, oh, well, I have a philosophy about that. I mean, they want to say, okay, well, I can do brain surgery. You know, <laughs> no, there, there isn't a, a long technical training that one needs to do to be a professional philosopher, but I don't think you need that in order to bring these ethical issues to bear on your research. They, they seem almost like critical thinking issues. Just asking why, what are the values here? Why are we doing this? How do we resolve conflicts? Um, so questions from the audience? Ben? Um, we've heard a few already, but could you maybe explicitly mention some best practices where technologists have tried to tackle ethical issues? Um, that, that you found compelling that you would like to share with computer science communities? That's a good question, putting us on the spot. Does anyone have any quick examples? Um, let me try something. It's not exactly a best practice, but... Um, oh, we should, I'm sorry, we should probably repeat the question. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. No, go for it. Oh, ben was asking if there's any specific examples of best practices around ethics and computer science. Um, I think there are some good ideas. Um, to, to go back to my own experience in dealing with security vulnerability information, I think there are some good practices there that are important. Um, and it starts with the idea that the researcher's responsibility is to benefit the public, uh, to, uh, to disclose the information, use the information in a way that benefits the public. Um, and that means, for example, that um, it's, um, it is a benefit to get the vulnerability that you've discovered fixed. And that means to cooperate fully with the company that um, makes a product if there's vulnerabilities in that product with those who are in a position to fix it. Um, at the same time, the primary responsibility is not to protect the reputation of that company, um, nor to harm it, um, but instead to uh, but instead to serve the members of the public who in most cases are in the position of being uh, customers. Um, and so what that means is it, if you think from that standpoint, um, there are some rules that have emerged from that. For example, you would treat a vulnerability differently if, uh, if it's unfixable um, as opposed to one that is fixable in which it's a best practice to try to wait until something is fixed before uh, and the fix has been widely deployed before disclosing it if that um, if the balance of harm b uh, and benefit and harm uh, seems to point in that direction. Um, but fundamentally thinking, starting from the viewpoint of what best protects the, um, uh, the, the, the members of the public who are using this thing. Um, I may want to just add that, I mean, I think that, you know, it's hard. I, I wish I knew, I wish I could say, like, here are some techniques you can specifically implement in your development process to make sure you're tackling these things. Um, I do think that there's great organizations that represent, like SMART, 
ethical approaches doing computer science research. I think a standout example would be Citizen Lab. Anyone doesn't know Citizen Lab? They're based out of the University of Toronto. They're consistently researching digital security threats. Um, you know, there's an update that was pushed to all iPhones last September, I believe it was, uh, that closed a zero-day bug that basically would allow people to, through a text message exploit, like turn on your microphone and camera. And uh, you know, they had a, I think, front page New York Times article come out about that. Uh, but they went through a very responsible process with Apple to make sure that they timed their publication at the same time that Apple did. I mean, I think that's it's more obvious when you get to those kinds of like security vulnerability loopholes. But I think the kind of message from that also is like. Um, I, I really like what Ed was saying. Like, think about the, the impact of populations as you're doing that research, and then um, maybe think about when you need to slow down a little bit. I think we're off. I at least felt that when I was trained as a technologist, it's like about rapidly trying and rapidly failing, and then iterating and working on again. And I think it's that can be a great principle. But the closer you get to like real world consequences, uh, the more harmful that can potentially be. <laughs> Uh, so I think especially when it comes to this space, it's about slowing down, thinking, building uh, uh, networks with people that can help challenge ideas for you. And then I think the last thing I'll come to is just um, not about the, the individual, the role of the individual itself, but the role of building up the the ability of civil society to 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 be a check on this kind of thing. You know, again, having organizations like Upturn or like we we support consumer. Uh, reports that are now doing testing on finding out, you know, how hackable are the systems in the cars that we drive, right? These like important questions that we need institutions that can help us challenge the, <coughs> excuse me, um, challenge those things. I don't have specific examples. I suspect there are <coughs> folks in the community who have been uh, maybe trying to teach some lectures and, you know, that we could reach out to. But uh, this again reminds me of, you know, I mentioned translational, <coughs> this idea of translational uh, science and translational data science in this case. If you look at, uh, there is a National Center for Advancing Translational Science, which is an NIH center, and they actually have five steps in translational science. It goes from basic research to animal testing, preclinical, pre clinical, and then public health. Uh, I actually think you can think in those, some terms like that, <clears throat> you're going from research to the next step to the next step, and that's where, <clears throat> some sorry, examples of I know where ethics could be inserted, uh, could come up in a scheme like that, because what you might do inside your own lab uh, in a very controlled setting may be one level of ethical issues. There, there are probably some, but that's at, at some level. But then if you decide, okay, let's put this out in open source software and see what happens, there's another level. And I think just like you say, slow down, think about that would be the way to do it. So uh, you posed a question for us, should ethics be foundational in this whole process and as a strategic uh, uh, data science funding activities? And obviously there are a lot of us here who think the answer is yes. What can we do to convince the NSF of that, to change practice, or you know, to, to push NSF further in the direction that you're already going? Uh, is it just uh, doing more panels, or what form should our efforts take? Um, well, I actually think um, <clears throat> you got uh, how many? Ten more days to go. Um, I, I actually think that the, the dear colleague letter that's out there right now on convergence and looking at workshops and harnessing data revolution for uh, um, uh, sort of education and training in the data science area. This this could be a topic there. That is, you know, if I'm if I'm thinking of uh, I hadn't actually I hadn't thought about. Ethics as an example, and I'm just beginning, just thinking of it. But if you said, look, everyone needs to, everyone who deals with data, should learn some basics of ethics. Okay, so then you can say, well, let's. What does that mean? Let's pursue that idea. And then you say, well, if you're an ecologist, you got to learn this this further stuff. Or if you're a medicine person, right? If you're doing something in medicine, then you go, there's another there's maybe another step or one more or some more ethical issues. You, uh, actually, we have discussed this a little bit uh, in our groups at NSF that you, you can sort of, I think, separate out data that relates to humans from data that doesn't relate to humans. So if I'm collecting information about the universe or a high energy physics, the issues are not the same. The moment you do anything with social science, medicine, etc. So, um, so, so you could, in other words, you could, 
maybe think about developing some general idea and then say, and then how does this project into different disciplines? So your first opportunity is the DCL. <laughs> That's already out there. Um, but, but I suppose, um, I have to say that the education directorate at NSF is very interested uh, and, and they, they are also getting lots of proposals in, related to data science and all of these areas. So even if the DCL comes and goes, uh, there should be other opportunities, I would think, yeah. I'm wondering whether you could say something about looking forward, what new issues in computer ethics um, we can expect, if you have any projections about this, and, and also how, how Princeton can contribute to research in these areas. All right, so what can Princeton do? Well, you know, Princeton is in a good position to be a leader on these issues um, because we, um, first of all, because it's an institution that is used to thinking about these sorts of big issues, but also because we have, um, but also because we have the different types of expertise and knowledge uh, and scholars here that are able to come at this from the different disciplinary perspectives. We have computer scientists who are interested in this topic and working in relevant areas. We have the Center for Human Values and um, and uh, uh, and uh, all of the resources and people there. We have social scientists who are uh, very interested in data-driven work and um, uh, and uh, deeply interested in the in the ethical issues there. Um, and so I think we're in, we are in a very good position to uh, to work in this area, and it's one that um, I I hope that we uh, where we I hope we do increase our uh, our effort going forward. So I can't address the Princeton question, uh, but um, so I, you know, I think a little bit more like an engineer uh, mm -hmm. from an applications point of view here. But I don't know if this would be brand new uh, research issues in ethics, but certainly these are newer issues in computer science. So there are issues of, for example, reproducibility. So reproducibility is becoming a very, very big, important thing increasingly. And so I, I don't know, are there any ethical issues related to that, for example? Uh, another thing, of course, that's happening, I mentioned convergence, but in real life what's happening is a lot more data integration. We're integrating data about all sorts of things, including individuals. So what are the, <clears throat> I mentioned one of the proposals, one of the uh, projects that NSF funded about uh, ethical issues with data aggregation. So more of those kind of things. If I bring completely data that you never thought you'd put together, and now you're putting it together. So each one may be, you know, just as we say, each uh, data set may be internally consistent, but when we bring it together, there could be inconsistency. Similarly, each data set may have been ethically connect collected, <laughs> but when you put it together, maybe there are some issues, so that's the integration issue. And the other one, uh, also from an engineering point of view, is I think we're increasing, increasingly going to a real-time world. Everything is gonna be real-time, or data processing, decision support, and so, if what's the ethical, ethical uh, challenges mm. when you have to make, somebody mentioned this morning about making decisions so quickly. Mm. And, yeah. um, so, everything, right? <laughs> like I think, if, uh, so, so I was just thinking for, for a moment about how, um, I was at a conference in, a, a small workshop actually in Philadelphia recently that um, I can't remember who put together. I know Dana Boyd, I think from Data Society was part of putting it together. And it was around kind of the, the, the theoretical computer science work behind developing more accountable algorithms or, or how you can enable transparency and accountability in algorithms. And it was interesting to me that I was thinking like, oh, right, this is coming after these like kind of exposed issues and stories around how algorithms can actually be really detrimental and cement bias rather than than reduce it, um, and you know, and that's I think that's okay. But I think it's important to note that that science, the like science question, is now being answered after the like problem uh, arose, and I can see that happening again and again. So I was going to give some examples, but these are not science questions yet. But I think science question, the science questions will come come there. Um, so it, when I said everything, it's about. You know, what we're thinking about at Ford is how do we embed a technology lens into all of our work? Um, and that doesn't mean where, I was just talking about this earlier, that doesn't mean like 
where are the technology solutions that we can pose. It's not about that. It's about how do you think critically about both the opportunities and the challenges that that technology presents. And so like one of our tech fellows right now is working on things like, you know, he's working with colleagues on things like, huh, we have a focus on corruption in our civic engagement and government unit. Um, what are the implications of virtual currencies on issues of corruption around the world? Like, hmm, okay. Uh, or the census is coming around again in 2020. Uh, this time, most of the census data collection will be done online. What does that mean for turnout? What does that mean for data collection? What does it mean for like who uh, is at, who gets to submit their data and who doesn't? Who's reachable and who's not? Um, you know, these are important questions that are coming up, and they're I think ethical questions that are coming up as a result of the intersection of technology and society. Uh, kind of growing, and then I'm curious to see what are going to be the kind of computer science questions that result from that, much like there are these new emerging questions that computer science is answering around things like accountable algorithms. So, um, On top of all of that, let me point to a couple of areas that I think will continue to grow in importance um, here. One is, uh, relates to the ethics around surveillance and pervasive data collection. Um, and the implications of that data collection and use. Uh, and the other is about um, uh, concentration of wealth and power, um, potentially increasing due to, the, uh, uh, due to the growing power of big data and machine learning, um, both of which inherently seem to reward greater scale. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you.